Hello everyone, this is Yoshimi and welcome back to the channel. I'm going to keep this intro brief as we have a lot to cover today, but in this video we will be going over tiers 3 and 4 of the Creepypasta Iceberg. If you are new to the channel, I hope you enjoy your stay and encourage you to watch the first video in the series before this one and check out some of the other topics I've covered on this channel. The script for this video was written by Time6, Maverick Files, and the iceberg was created by Reddit user of Argus. Before we start, I also want to thank you all so much for us reaching 15,000 subscribers on this channel. Never in my life would I think that I would get this far, and I could not have done it without any of y'all's support and viewership over the past two years I've been doing YouTube. That being said, I hope you all enjoyed the video we have for you tonight as we delve deeper into the creepy pasta iceberg. Starting off tier 3, we have Funny Mouth. Funny Mouth is a story about an internet user that chats with a storyteller and quickly becomes disturbing. What is unknown is that Funny Mouth secretly stands above the storyteller each night and salivates on his face, implying that Funny Mouth isn't just a weird internet being, but a paranormal entity. After some time passes, the storyteller's jaw feels funny and seems to be falling off. At the end of the story, the storyteller looks in the mirror and comments that he has a funny mouth. This suggests him becoming another funny mouth and this is how it spreads, some sort of internet based contagion. The Harbinger Experiment, a story based on a mad scientist who discovers powers not from this world. The story is told through the perspective of an assistant to the scientist, who handpicked and captured test subjects for his experiments. The scientist goes on to summon beings from another world who brutally massacre the victims before escaping from their chambers. The last monster plays Living in the Sunlight by Tiny Tim as it slaughters all the scientists, with the assistant barely making it out alive. But he knows his days are limited, because he can hear that song again in the distance. Spongebob Bootleg Episode Add this to our list of lost episodes, for this tape was supposedly found in December 2004 by a group of five teenagers. The teens were rummaging around in a trash can within an abandoned mental institution and came across this VHS tape. Of these five individuals, two have committed suicide, one has gone missing, and one refuses to comment on the tape, and the last hastily agreed to give paranormal investigators the tape shortly after being interviewed about the suicide and disappearances of the other three people. The current whereabouts of the tape are unknown, but there is a screenshot taken of a scene within the episode, with Spongebob having the deranged, manic look in his eyes. It is said that whoever stares at this image long enough, you may see Spongebob blink. Stubbs Clubhouse A creepypasta about growing up watching a low-budget ripoff of Pee-wee's Playhouse. Everything from the music, to the set, to the costumes were all extremely low-maintenance. Overall, it follows the same pattern as most Lost episode descriptions. Weird music, odd colors, and eventually disturbing images were displayed. However, Stubb was supposed to be just an ordinary clown, wearing a rainbow jacket and pants with stars on them. But the problem is, only kids could see him, and once you watched an episode, Kids began to see Stubbs in real life. The story ends with OP discovering that Stubbs wasn't just on their TV. He was in their home, in his little sister's room. Normal Porn for Normal People A creepypasta story about a man who discovers an underground adult-themed website that features a series of videos depicting bizarre acts of sexual fetishes and self-mutilation, eventually turning to animal abuse and severe traumatic videos. The Theater Normally, creepypastas about games are just super rare hacked ROMs or cursed versions of childhood favorites. But in the instance of the theater, the game itself is the creepypasta. There's no developer of the game, there's no CD art, and if you attempt to install it, your entire computer computer will get locked, but if you manage to get past that glitch, you are greeted by the ticket taker, who you'll keep running into repeatedly. He greets you, you walk into the theater and it fades to black, you then appear outside, in front of the ticket taker, and these steps are repeated, over and over and over. But some players report that, in some of their playthroughs, the ticket taker would disappear and he would re be replaced by a creature with a swirled head. It would then be followed by loud noises, disturbing imagery, and then screen cuts to black. But the swirly head man would disappear display himself on a screen sometimes, although very quickly, which would then be followed by a loud scream. After this, the ticket taker seems to be extremely panicked, running back and forth. If you talk to him, he simply says, never reach the other levels. Your screen fades to black, you return to the theater, and you're now faced with a large brick wall. If you touch the wall, your game crashes. After this phenomena, some players state that sometimes, when by themselves, they will see the swirly head man in the corner of their eyes outside of the game. 
Stairs. A story about an old lady who lived by herself. Unable to look after herself in her two-story house, she was bound to a wheelchair, unable to get out. Because of this, a caretaker had looked after her, tending to her basic needs since her husband had mysteriously died. The old lady needed physical assistance to take her up and down the stairs, being held like an infant due to her inability to move. One day, the old lady calls 911 and reports that her caretaker had been brutally murdered on the first floor. The investigator arrives on scene and finds that the caretaker had her vocal cords removed out of her throat before dying. The old lady watches from the top of the stairs as they swab, take information, and take pictures. He then asks to visit upstairs, where the old lady sat in her wheelchair. She insists that she's been upstairs the whole time, but he inspects anyways and discovers that there is no phone upstairs. So then, if the old woman was disabled, who called the police? The inspector turns around, only to find the wheelchair now empty. Tulpa. A story about a man who partakes in a psychological experiment. He ends up making a tulpa of himself, which is when you generate enough energy in your mind to create a paranormal being that only you see and feel. Unfortunately, his own tulpa develops sadistic, warped ideas. But in order for this to happen, that would mean the man himself had these tendencies originally. After being drugged and tormented by the scientists, he broke free and ran home. Once he semi-recovered, he reported the scientists to the police, only to find that the lab was abandoned. The scientists had all had fake names, and the money he was given for this experiment was untraceable. But his tulpa, his tulpa had escaped too, and was hungry for blood. Kage Kao, a creepypasta about a demon who takes human shapes but wears an odd black and white mask over his face. He asks his victims if they'd like to play, before exposing them to long, brutal bouts of torture that often results in their death. Ironically, there's more content to this character's relationships with other creepypastas than there is content for his own plot and origin story. Obey the Walrus, a real video that's entire premise is based off being creepy and odd. It shows Andros from Star Fox as he begins to sing Itsy bitsy spider. The audio pitches way up all of the sudden as the trippy visuals display before cutting to an old video of a drag queen tap dancing. Said drag queen was paralyzed from polio as a young child, so their movement is seen as bizarre and unsettling. The entire time the video plays, there's a distorted version of Itsy Bitsy Spider playing in the background. Rap Rat Based off an actual rather obscure board game, this creepypasta story states that a live action puppet mascot was created in a sweatshop. But during this time in the sweatshop, a child who worked on the sewing machine had gotten stuck in a machine and was brutally killed. The child's mother put a curse on the company, stating that the blood of the innocent coats all who interact with this puppet and anything related to the puppet. Before leaving, she proclaims that they will be cursed by Apparat. Laughing it off, the management team goes on to name the puppet Raprat, a jab towards the name Apparat. After this, many of the factory workers begin killing themselves in grotesque matters. Eventually, the puppet is reported to have moved by itself, finding in mysterious areas that they didn't leave it in. The company gets bought by Mattel, who produces the board game called Rap Rat. The Pocket. A creepypasta monster shares a very similar traits to a skinwalker. It kills and eats its victim before wearing their skin as a disguise long enough until they get their next victim. The story ends with the main character discovering his wife may have been the Pocket for a short time before he is then murdered. The story is also rumored to be the reason why subreddit r slash no sleep has the rule stories must be plausible. This means that the narrator must be physically and mentally capable of posting that the events of the story cannot be proven to be false on a large scale. Stories posted in second person or third person omniscient must have a clear stated believable reason for being written as such. The Passenger, a creepypasta monster. However, there's technically two different passenger creatures written by two separate authors, but we'll go with the one that came out in 2013 versus the one that came out in 2015. A woman, struggling with debt, takes a late bus home from her job. She accidentally falls asleep before waking up to find that she had now had a passenger sitting beside her. Only problem is, the passenger is not from this world. Ash's Coma Theory the Theory claims that in Season 1, when Ash rushes Pikachu to the hospital and falls down, that he didn't ever get back up. But instead, this fall resulted in him falling into a coma, and every sequence that ever occurred afterwards were all a part of a long coma-induced dream. The theory backs itself up by stating that Ash, while meeting brand new people and traveling across many lands, had never actually aged. Ash always remained 10 years old. 
The Diary of Mr. Well Done. Unlike the majority of the pasta so far, this story actually tells itself through the perspective of the monster, implying the monster, Mr. Well Done, wrote this story. While not nearly as long as the other creepypasta sagas, it is still written in multiple parts. Mr. Well Done seems to be an eldritch being that is capable of seeing and knowing all before humanity, and the secrets of the universe are full of more beasts, according to Mr. Well Done. However, there's actually a secret document of his that reveals that Mr. Weldon had been around since the beginning of time. He states that he has been titled multiple names over time, and that a name is simply that, a name, a title. But Mr. Weldon isn't just a name, he is everything and everywhere. White with Red The short story is about a man who rents out a room in a supposedly haunted hotel. The front desk clerk warned him multiple times not to enter the room next to his, and because of this, his interest was piqued. One night, he puts his eyes to the keyhole to discover a woman crying in the room. Thinking nothing of it, he goes to sleep and wakes up the next day. Again, his interest is still being piqued. He puts his eyes to the keyhole, but this time, all he could see was red, as if someone had covered the keyhole with something red. Confused, he goes downstairs and bothers the clerk about the room. She sighs and says, a long time ago, a man had murdered his wife in that very room. We shut the room down after people said they find a ghostly woman, but her eyes were simply just the color red. Chat Room 98 The story tells about a boy who had found a CD stashed away in his house, labeled Chat Room 98. At first, he believes he's talking to a chatbot until said bot begins listing off details about the boy that not even a real person from a chat room should be able to know. And finally, it makes its presence known. Within the house. Within the room. God's Mouth Essentially a creepypasta about a vora cave and two people get swallowed by God's mouth. Psychosis, an incredibly well-written series of stories that actually ended up becoming a book. In it, a man named John, who suffers from a severe case of paranoia, barricades himself inside his basement apartment. He's convinced that some sort of Lovecraftian monsters have taken over the world, but his mind constantly doubts itself. As the outside world beckons, he begins to wonder if his delusions are actually justified. Persuaded, a creepypasta story about an outbreak that causes animals and humans to react violently. But this isn't just your average zombie apocalypse. These are full-on sprinting, flesh-devouring zombies. And what's even worse, they learned how to speak. Out with a bang. The story starts off by instantly saying, I've decided to kill myself. The protagonist then goes on to describe how he's been given, if not cursed, with the ability to turn his fingers into a gun. But he discovers his secret power in the most morbid way possible against his best friend, against a child in the park, and against his girlfriend. He is left with no other option but to go out with a bang. Ted the Caver Another lengthy yet well-written creepypasta. The story follows a blog post from 2001 describing two adventurous experienced friends destined to explore a brand new cave. However, they discover that they're not just digging into any cave. As they go deeper and deeper, they're surrounded by ghostly screams, sounds of things climbing towards them, and even discover strange hieroglyphs. They decide to abandon the cave, only to become increasingly traumatized by sudden hallucinations. They agree for one last time to visit the cave, and Ted tells his blog that he'll return with an update to the blog. The blog remains unupdated. I did a video on Ted the Caver recently that you should check out if you would like to know more information about the creepypasta itself, as well as the information provided after the creepypasta was written. Ronald McDonald House A story about a troubled foster child going from foster home to foster home until left with no other options. It was either the military or the Ronald McDonald House. Almost instantly, the storyteller regrets his decision after discovering the gore gruesome truth behind the foster home. But that's not all. The storyteller finally discovers what really goes inside a Happy Meal. One Man Hide and Seek, also known as One Man Tag, it's a creepypasta game that is a ritual for contacting the dead. It is said that spirits are always looking for bodies to possess. In this ritual, you will summon such a spirit by offering it a doll instead of a human body. You must name the doll, leave it in water, turn on your TV, and begin counting down. Then return to the doll, stating that now it's your turn to hide. Take the doll out of the water, stab it with a sharp tool, and then leave to your hiding place. It is said that the spirit inside the doll will attempt to communicate via the TV static. After you get your hiding place, your next step is simple. Pray you're not found. String Theory Also known as imps, while based on an actual scientific theory, the story itself focuses on the idea that everything you do, everything you say, everything you will eventually do, 
has already been destined for you. One morning, the storyteller recalls how they could see every single string surrounding everyone. He finds an imp who quietly is hanging strings outside, and the two begin to discuss the actual reality. The story ends with the main character realizing that while he is now has free will, he will now forever be alone, as every single human being to ever exist already has fate strung out for them. They cannot and will not interact with the storyteller since his string no longer exists. In the last moment plea, he begs to be restrung. Where Bad Kids Go I don't know if this technically falls under the subgenre of lost episodes or not, so I'll let you decide. The storyteller recalls a show they'd watched as a kid when they lived in Lebanon. Due to the mass bombings that Lebanon was under, OP had no choice but to stay inside and watch TV. An Arabic show called Where Bad Kids Go would come on and begin displaying generic quotes like bad kids steal cookies or bad kids don't listen to their parents. Finally, the episode would end with a camera zooming into a door. Horrific audio would begin playing, described as a mixture between blood-curdling screams and pained echoes that seemed to come from the inside. Text would display on the screen saying, this is where bad kids go. Several years later, OP would become a journalist and would attempt to seek out the truth. They broke into the studio, now vacant and charred from a fire, only to find there appeared to be a destroyed microphone hanging from the ceiling, pointing towards a door, a door completely bolted and well did shut. The Wyoming Incident, a creepypasta about a TV station that had its signal hijacked by a hacker. The broadcast was interrupted by a special presentation announcement in which a video would play. The video contained numerous clips of disembodied human heads showing various emotions and poses. The hacker had never been caught, nor has the hacked broadcast ever been identified. The Holders A creepypasta story mentioning how there are beings called holders. Each holder is bound to an item of significant importance. However, if all holders were to come together, holding all 538 objects that they were bound to, the world would fold in on itself, destroying the very fabric of reality. While it sounds simple enough to just not gather together, these certain objects create a lust that embedded deep inside humanity. If you find out that someone is trying to find an object, then they have already been bound to its curse. Stop them at any means necessary. Starting Tier 4, we have Masterpiece, another classic creepypasta story. The storyteller explains that they heard a noise earlier, discovered that their parents had been murdered, and that something had propped the parents' bodies up against the bed, staring at them. But they're too afraid to move, because whatever had killed their parents will kill them. Their eyes adjusted to the darkness in the room, and could finally see that the monster wrote something on the wall, in blood. The message states, I know you're awake. The Showers, a very lengthy series that eventually was turned into a book. The storyteller recalls his favorite teacher discussing a piece of land in Nebraska, to which he simply called The Showers. After finally remembering all the weird things the teacher said about it, he decides to investigate the land with a friend. Upon arrival, they discover strange, paranormal happenings, such as seeing the ghosts of children and a mysterious smell of rot. And then, years later, his girlfriend pesters him to visit The Showers via a road trip. It appears to be some sort of haunted ground, but it still may all be a metaphor towards handling trauma as a kid, and using alcohol as a cheap suppressant. The showers perhaps only exist for those damaged enough to visit. Happy Sun Daycare A creepypasta story about a demented daycare place that tormented and abused children. But they didn't just hit children or yell at them, no, they did much worse. They locked bad kids into a cramped area with a werewolf. The Perfect Child, a story about a mother who gives birth to a child, supposedly the perfect child. It is in fact so beautiful that people will do anything for the child. A nurse murders the mother, a random hospital occupant murders the nurse, the hospital occupant's wife comes home and murders him, and then the wife brutally murders her own child just so she can give more attention to the perfect child. Finally, two policemen arrive on the scene and walk into the room to see a woman, and a rotting, blue-skinned, decayed corpse of an infant. But that's not what the other policeman saw. Oh no. To him, the blue-skinned, decayed corpse 
was the perfect child, and he'll do whatever it takes to make sure it's his. Vultures, a lengthy story written in a really unique, although quite complicated style. It was shrugged off because of its grammatical issues, but if you're capable of ignoring the slight issue, then it's a recommended read. In short, there's technically three stories being told in layers all at once. Lair, or Story 1, is about a dying man and the people associated with him. Lair 2 uses metaphors of vultures and deer to symbolize the relationship that the dying man has with the associated people. These aren't his family and friends. They're people people waiting to strike greedily and devour whatever value the man leaves behind. And the final layer is an analogy of a poker game. Each person's actions permanently determines their path in this game, and even though everyone ends up getting what they wanted, in the end, no one truly wins this game. There was never a vulture tearing flesh, it was simply greed existing within the family. Booth World Industries. This is an interactive creepypasta with quite some lore behind it, followed by prequels and sequels, but this story alone is about a man who moves into a cabin that requires some touching up. He calls a plumber, but is instead greeted by an operator at Booth World Industries. He gives his name, and they state that he is already in the system, so he gives a fake name, which proves to be pointless. Finally, he gives the name of an ex-girlfriend that he had, and at the time of the appointment, he gets a call from her, with her screaming and shrieking as she gets murdered. The author, now realizing that this is some sort of line for Hitman, decides to call back and give the plumber's name, but the operator states that she already has the author's name scheduled, and in order to cancel, he would need to have a thousand people register with Boothworld, aka in order to save his life, he'd need a thousand people to die. The story ends with him giving the reader the number to Boothworld Industries. A story told through an investigator recalling an unsolved murder in his town. He's tagged along with a journalist who is actively trying to land her next story. Once they find where the bodies may be, the two break in only to find that the family is still alive. Still alive after 20 years. Except their bodies have all been surgically malformed in order to be pressed down in agonizing pain until they were approximately 4 inches high. For 20 years they were worked on tortured, irreversibly damaged just to have their bodies then stacked on top of each other, like a stack of pancakes. Super Mario 128, a creepypasta about a rare Nintendo video game that was supposed to be released for the GameCube. While it's your basic super spooky video game pasta with the creepy graphics and unsettling messages, like Bowser threatening to kill Peach, it is rumored to actually be a metaphor for how Nintendo dreads their fans. The fans want something mature. Now they're tired of the PG-esque Mario Land stuff, but yet, when Nintendo makes something more mature, the fans tear it apart as well. Stuck between a rock and a hard place, Nintendo has no choice but to simply keep moving forward. Autopilot, a short creepypasta story describing the day-to-day -day agenda of your average man. How you wake up, begin your shower, and you fall into this autopilot routine. Even though some things may change on a daily basis, your routine keeps you stagnant and focused. So focused that you forget to unbuckle your daughter from her car seat. So focused that you forget how hot the temperature was supposed to get today. So focused that even on your way home, you don't really notice the smell of dead, rotting meat in your car's back seat. All because you were on autopilot. Pilot. Romanian Knowledge Experiment A story about a rumored government operation that involved taking three people and dropping them off on three separate days in a closed off forest. Each was given a pack of supplies and was told to journal their thoughts as they made their way to a cabin. They all write that something is out there in the woods. The first only sees the silhouette of something because of his oil lamp. The second only sees blobs of orange because of his night vision camera. The third has a digital camera and reports seeing a large monster almost unexplainable to the human eye. The third person never made it to the cabin. The Tale of Robert Elm, a lengthy story about an old man who comes to the same bar for years, never speaking to anyone until the bartender asks about his story. The man, being Robert Elm, then begins to talk about how he was capable of escaping death from the ancient eldritch cult as he killed off everyone one by one. Every story ends with the victim receiving some form of torture, but not this one. This time, the victim wins. Secret Bar, a creepypasta about a newly turned 21 year old attempting to experience the bizarre side of town finally gets a once in a lifetime invitation to a bar that deems itself as a journey to hell. However, the name itself isn't far from the truth. Chain smokers are forced to permanently smoke until their throats turn to ash, self lovers are forced to touch themselves until their skin rubs off, left with flesh and blood. Perhaps welcome to hell isn't just their slogan. 
Liars. A story with a similar background is Jeff the Killer, where a kid gets severely wounded to the point of no return. In Jeff, it was from fire. But for Jimmy, it was acid being poured onto his face. His victims get away scot-free, as Jimmy is left permanently scarred. While the story ends in a pretty basic style, with it just being about vengeance, the real shock is from the image they used, which was later found out to be cover art for a CD by experimental rock band also named Liars, which just makes this particular creepypasta even more strange in hindsight. Kill Switch. This title is listed later in the bottom tier, but since it's listed twice, I'll just cover it now. An extremely rare creepypasta game, much like the theater. The game could only ever be played once. When the player died, the game erased itself from their system. The game has two different characters to play as, although only one scenario can be completed due to the aforementioned single playthrough. The characters were a girl named Porto and Ghast. Like most creepypasta games, it's full of unsettling imagery and disturbing images, but playing the game leaves a drastic effect towards those who play it. Baraska. This has to be the longest creepypasta on the entire iceberg. One scariest story of 2015. Mr. Creepypasta has two videos on the complete series reaching seven hours long. It also, I believe, is a creepypasta that had reached Hollywood status, with Cole Sprouse voice acting the main character Sam Walker in a podcast that came out in 2020. Sam Walker moves to the town of Drisking, Missouri one summer and quickly befriends two other kids, Kyle and Kimber. They take a trip to a strange treehouse, where you are supposed to carve your name on the tree or you'll disappear. When Sam's sister, Whitney, actually does disappear a few months later, he spends five lonely years wondering what happened to her. When more people start disappearing suddenly, the three take it upon themselves to find out what's happening to all the disappearing people and what connection the disappearances hold with the mountain outside of town. The Portrait Also known as the cabin in the woods, Under goes into a cabin all by himself to find that there are strange portraits of people staring at him in the middle of the night. Weirded out by this, he rolls away in the bed and falls back asleep. Once he wakes up, he decides to take down the portraits only to find they aren't portraits, but in fact, windows. Fog. A story told from a dead man's handwritten letter, a warning about a mysterious finding. They come across what can only be described as an eldritch being that fills every victim with animalistic murderous rage. The Pastel Man. A creepypasta story about an entity that makes deals with people to save their dying loved ones. However, the Pastel Man is then allowed to kill somebody who has impacted the person's life. Its real name is unknown, since speaking its real name would summon it to you. So it was nicknamed The Pastel Man. Toter's Maze, a creepypasta video game that falls under the trope of so rare that it's difficult to believe it ever existed. It follows a lot of the same ideas of previous video game creepypastas, such as strange happenings, weird messages, and paranormal encounters. It appears that the game built in the 90s may have more to it than the simple keyboard input instructions. The game seems to display its maps based off memories of the player, with the player actually controlling the monster the entire time. It unfortunately breaks the common rule of creepypastas, because the storyteller does die in the end. The Grey Man. Creepypasta based off a hacked ROM of PS1's LSD Dream Emulator. But unlike the actual game, there appears to be an entity within this game. An entity that haunts the dreams of those who play it torturing them in dreams that seem to last weeks even if they only sleep for minutes, disorienting reality to the point of no return. Binary DNA In the story, it describes very unique computer files, unattainable to the common hacker, nor decipherable to the common investigator. It contains several files full of strange audio and pictures. However, the theory originates from a very old wives' tale, that when you take a picture of someone, you capture their soul in the camera, and that the very picture now can control their soul. So what happens when you take someone's soul? and convert it into data. Is there something secretly within our binary that can translate to a file? Sounds crazy. Until a group of hackers discover this very thing. After a sudden tragic deaths of the group, the files have been locked up with the government, never to be seen again. An Egg A very unique tale, placing itself through the eyes of God. You have recently just died from a severe accident and are now discussing mortality with the creator of life. He begins to inform you that you shouldn't be worried, as everyone on the entire earth, everyone who has ever existed and will come to exist, is a reincarnation of you. Finally, God informs you that one day you will become God, but first you have to live through every single human life throughout all of time. That is when you become God, and you get your own universe. The story ends with the spirit moving on to 
becoming another human, the princess. A creepypasta based off a fictional game called Hero and Princess. The story is about a man who creates the concept of the princess for the game. However, due to budget and timing, the princess concept was then discarded. But her original designer grew increasingly obsessed with the princess, until one day, he took his life. Ever since then, the new projects that the company worked on would run into severe glitches, where a white sprite with red hair would show up, practically breaking the game. Eventually, the projects were cancelled, and the company was abandoned. Queen's Guard. The actual title is, I was a part of Queen's Guard in England, one of the rare jobs where you aren't allowed to move, no matter what stands in front of you. A long series, supposedly with four parts written, however the first two only show up when googled, with the updated Facebook group no longer being accessible. It tells of a man who gets stalked by some form of entity in the shape of a woman. Every time she's around, she begins counting down the same numbers, increasingly getting shorter and shorter. By the end of her countdown, she is completely disfigured, with her mouth tearing the skin open. Whoever is around her when she reaches zero follows the exact same fate. Dying Hat, a creepypasta based around the Tamodachi Life game for the Nintendo 3DS, it is written almost entirely in dialogue form, with a few details here and there. A conversation is had with the storyteller and their friend before discovering that his friend had taken his own life after playing Tamodachi Life. Lost and confused, the storyteller begins trying to put the pieces together as to what caused his friend to do this. As he unravels more disturbing footage from the game, he makes the final connection. Whenever a character dies in the game, they and they will die, the person playing them dies. What makes it even more settling is that the antagonist, Mr. Happy, claims he will make you happy before your character takes their life. Paid for in blood. A story about cave explorers attempting to discover riches beyond their greatest imagination. But ignorance truly is bliss as they mine further and further, discovering previous explorers' corpses. However, they soon discover that the sea still walk, still cave, still eat. And worst of all, these corpses are not the only thing down there, as they come face to face with what only can be described as a Lovecraftian pit of flesh and gore, controlling these deceased expeditioners. The story ends with the owner of the land demanding more miners go in and find these these great riches. Mistman, a lengthy story via the form of a blog post about a man who gets framed for the mysterious murder of his best friend, and then framed for the murders of two more of his friends, and then framed for the murders of an entire hospital lobby, all signs point to him, and now his life is in shambles. Who's going to believe him when he tells his blog that everyone is being murdered by a demon? The story ends with the storyteller figuring out that the more people that know about the Mistman, the more powerful it becomes, and thus, he submits his last post to his blog receiving almost 4,000 comments. 1 million viewer. A story about a kid who gets a spam email, asking if he wanted to earn 1 million viewers fast. Going along with it, he soon discovers that it's not a hoax. He soon reaches YouTube fame, without knowing that he just sacrificed his life for glory. I found a hidden door in my cellar. A creepypasta about a husband and wife who built a wine cellar, only to leave it abandoned sometime later. But it may not be as abandoned as they thought, when they discovered that a man like Cryptid had been living inside there for quite a few centuries. 0917 2010 A classic story about what happens when you buy items off the internet. What was supposed to be an empty laptop ends up having unlabeled video and picture files. The storyteller then discovers that the original laptop owner used to stalk a woman. What starts with recording the victim from afar quickly descends when a video shows the victim being tied to a chair and brutally beaten. The final video plays to find a new woman bringing in a large trash bag and then filling a bathtub with corrosive substances. Once the storyteller turns it all to the police, he discovers that it was not a, the man who stalked the woman, but rather his wife, and the woman she was stalking was a girl he was having an affair with. And there you have it, part 2 of the creepiest creepypasta iceberg. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell notification if you would like to see more from me. If you would like to further support my work and the content I create, I have an optional Patreon where you're able to donate $5 a month to support the channel. With that being said, thank you for everything. This has been Yoshimi, and have a good night.